Hi everyone, it's Mr. Silva here. This is the first of a series of videos on Unit 8. So Unit 8 covers a lot of advanced features in HTML and web design. So we're going to be going through those. I will caution you that these are a little bit more challenging than what we are traditionally used to, but we'll talk about that in just a minute. So this is for Unit 8, Lesson 1. So I do start this off with a caution um, because of the fact that this unit is rather tricky. Uh, a lot of the information is beyond the scope of this course, but if you're interested in web design, this may be something that you do in the future, or if you decide to go beyond the basic level class that we have here. Uh, this unit will talk about some of the more advanced features in HTML and CSS. You won't be expected to know how to do it, but rather you'll just need to know what it's about. So when you do take the quiz in about a week or two, you will be expected to know what features are available. You just don't know, need to know how to do them. Some of the labs that we'll be doing in this unit do cover this, but they're going to be very, very basic, just so you can get the idea and the hang of it. Um, it's just a preview, a brief overview of some of the advanced features. Um, and if you do want to go into web design later and you say, hey, this is something I'm really interested in, this at least gets you started on that path. So to start, extending HTML. You don't have to use just HTML in web pages. We're going to talk about some of the other things that you can potentially use. So we're going to talk about server side and client side scripting languages. We'll talk about the DOM model and dynamic HTML. We'll talk about HTML5 application programming interfaces called APIs. We'll talk about web application frameworks and we'll talk about databases. So these are all some very basic advanced features that we'll talk about. Again, we're gonna talk about them very briefly. We're not gonna go into too much detail about them. These technologies are used in conjunction with HTML, Java, and CSS. So remember we talked about the trifecta of web design, HTML, Java, and CSS. Now that we're combining those, we're going beyond that to create some pretty dynamic web pages. So the first thing we'll talk about is server-side and client-side scripting. You need to know some of the following terms, and they're going to be on the next couple of slides. These are all some very basic programming terms. Some of these you may be familiar with because you've used them in the past, or if you've taken a coding class in the past, you should be a little bit familiar with them. So the first one is a variable, um, which should be familiar for you if you've done any science experiments. Uh, in our case, a variable is a place in memory to store information for later. It's used in simple applications and it's essential in complex ones. So it's created using the equal sign and often referred to values preceded with the dollar sign. Most language are case specific. So if you have one with a capital letter, it would be different from one with a lowercase letter. So for example, if you have the word um, cat and you use it with a lowercase letter, it would be very different from one with a capital letter for cat. Array is our next word. This is a collection of variables stored in a series. So a variable is just a single thing, whereas an array is a collection of a bunch of variables. It holds multiple values, while a variable, variable only holds one, as I just mentioned. A function is a line of code that allows you to refer to an entire series of steps or commands, and it's used to organize code into discrete sections. An interpreter is software used to read and process code in standard text files, either on the server or downloaded. Some languages require a first line to have the correct reference to the interpreter or the script will fail. We'll talk about some of these in a bit when we get into some of the programming languages, but an interpreter is very important in some programming languages because if they don't have that first line, the script will fail. Next is a compiler. A compiler is an application used to process the code in standard text files and executable application. So think of a compiler as the bridge between making the text go from text to making it into an actual functioning application. Include is a set of files called a library that you can refer to in your code. And it's used to avoid recreating code that you've already written. Um, Include would be very useful, so you don't have to spend a whole lot of time typing out your code. Um, print, 
print is the command that prints the application output to a destination, and it's usually a computer screen. So once you hit print, it takes that information you've typed in, it executes it and displays it wherever it needs to display. Echo is a command that repeats the input you type back to a terminal or an application window. And it can be used in an application to repeat input so that it can be processed. Essentially, you type it and it repeats it back to you. And lastly, a statement is a logical construct that allows you to control the way information flows into the application. Those are the vocabulary terms you need to know. Programming statements. So in a programming statement, scripts control the way that information flows within it, and an application must sometimes determine an action if a condition happens or when a certain condition exists. So sometimes when you type something, you need to have a backup plan in case something does not work. So the first is if-then statements. This one should be rather familiar for some of you. If-then statements only occur if a particular condition is true. So for example, a computer may check to see if the file is available, and if so, that file will open and run. But in layman's terms, if I see a cat, I'll attempt to pet the cat. Okay. Classic if-then statements allow only one condition to occur, known as a conditional statement. So in my example with my cat, if I have, if I see a cat, I'm going to go pet it. There's no other option for me there. If then else statements. They are very similar to if then statements, but it has additional commands if the condition ends up being false. So for example, if the folder is not available, it will check another location to see if it's available. And in another example, if I see a cat, I'm going to attempt to pet it, but if the cat runs away and it doesn't allow me to pet it, I'm going to frown and I'm going to continue on my way because that cat has other things to do. So keep in mind, if then else, if the condition occurs, then it's going to do that. But if it's not able to do that, it's going to do something else instead. Do while. This runs a specific sent process while a specified condition is true. So an application for example, may continue to present an alternative window while the mouse is being right-clicked. So while an action is happening, something else may be happening as well. So for example, when I am petting a cat, I will smile. So do when or do while occurs when an action is occurring, and while that action is occurring, something else is, is doing something as well. Do until is similar to do while. It runs the subprocess until a specified number of events have occurred. Okay, so in this case, a do until will mean it's going to do that specific thing that you've told it to do until there's a condition for it to stop. So you may have a continue until the until the statement sum reaches 100. So for example, if you're doing something on the computer and you're having like a counter go until like 100. And after it hits 100, it stops. That's a do until. Once it hits 100, it's done. So in my example with cats, I may pet my cat, or I may pet the cat that I find until the cat walks away and says it's done. That's a do until. After that, I can't pet the cat anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and continue on about my way. A break. This is when in a statement allows an application to break out of an infinite loop in case of a problem. So if you are coding and programming something and you have a situation occur where there it becomes into an infinite loop, it can't stop. In that case, there's a break and the break kind of allows for it to stop what it's doing in case it can't get out of that infinite loop. So for example, I may continue to pet, but the cat doesn't want does not want pet anymore, so it breaks out of that loop. So if I'm petting the cat and the cat's getting a little annoyed with me, it's able to break out of that loop because even though I'm continuing petting the cat, if the cat doesn't want pet anymore, he's able to break out of that infinite loop of me continuing to pet. All right, so now that we've talked about some of the basics of programming languages, let's go ahead and talk about server-side languages. So server-side languages have the following. They have code executed by the web server and not the browser. 
Code is generally placed into files and they're called applications and code execute because an interpreter has been installed and activated on the web server. So the big key takeaway here is that it's a web server process and not a browser process. So some of the basic things that it's used for, browser detection, database connectivity, cookie creation and identification, log on scripts, hit counters, file uploading and downloading. These are all just basic things. This is not a complete list, but those are some of the things that we will talk about. So the common types of server-side languages that we're gonna cover are PHP, Perl, Active Server Pages, Visual Basic, Python, C Sharp, and Java. So the first one we'll talk about is PHP Hypertext Preprocessor. This is an integrated server side scripting language and it's used for dynamic web pages. It's embedded in HTML pages, but is always executed on a web server. So it can be, it is going to be put into an HTML page, but the web server processes it. On uh, the next slide, we'll talk about the code for PHP that would create the message, hello world. And those of you who've done programming in the past, you're probably wondering why hello world is always picked. And that's because it's usually to see if code actually works and it's a good way to test. So in this example, this is the code over here on the side. This is what PHP looks like. So it starts with this right here, the little caret question mark PHP. It starts the statement to begin the code and the image below shows what this would turn into, okay? Um, PHP server side code has detected the user agent used to access it, and it can be used to customize experience depending on the browser used. So this is used in Firefox or on Google Chrome rather. It would be completely different in a different web browser. And you can change it so that if a person accesses your page on let's say Firefox or Safari or Edge, they could get different messages. Next is practical extraction and report language. This is a more commonly known language. It is a cross-platform programming language and it can be used to create custom CGI programs. We talked about CGI in the past. If you're unfamiliar with it, go back and look at some other modules and system management programs. And it's used for various purposes. There's a lot that Perl can be used for, but one of the most ones we use it for is web server processes. So remember last, two slides ago now that we talked about what it would look like. This is how Perl looks like. And this is what it would do the same thing as the PHP did. So this could be, this code would have the same result as the PHP example. And notice the uh, pound symbol exclamation point that starts off the code here. This is called in Perl the shebang. Um, and it's used in Perl to um, point to start the Perl interpreter, okay? Um, most problems with Perl start with a mistake in the shebang. So if the shebang is not there, it won't code. Active server pages called ASP using VBS script. Um, this is Microsoft's original server side scripting solution and PHP is an alternative to ASP. So when we talked about ASP, um, or when we talked about PHP, this is an alternative option. This is the same thing. Remember when we talked about PHP and I showed you what it would look like? This is the same thing. This is the code that would result in the same response. This code also does browser detection. Python. You may be a little bit familiar with Python. Uh, it is a popular programming language and it is used more in elementary, middle and high schools because it's very simple to use. It was developed in the 1980s, but it didn't really get started getting popular until around 2004. It's very easy to use and it's one that you can pick up with some lessons and training. It is object oriented and there's a lot of framework, so it makes it very flexible to use. It's very well documented and it usually requires a lot less code to do some of the same things. Due to its easiness, it's starting to challenge JavaScript. But for web development, it is typically slower and it can't build high quality 3D graphics. 
Now Go. This is often called Gulang, and it's a programming language made by Google. There's a smaller amount of users, but it's starting to get bigger and bigger each year. Um, it has higher, not, higher production speed and has larger advantages in, in its compiler. It was purposely made to speed up the development process. Compiling to machine code and without using a virtual machine, and that's what Java uses, and it could create large scale projects quickly. Um, so because it's simplified and made it faster, you can get a lot more done using it than Java. It's built with speed in mind, and it works to make projects done in a quicker time, as I mentioned. And the cross-platform, and it produces, it's a cross-platform, and it produces a single executable file without any necessary files. So it makes it quicker to make a distributed project. So Go is all about speed here. It's about getting it done quickly so that you can do it and get your languages done quick. However, it may sound perfect, it is not. It does not include common programming elements. These are some common programming elements, generic typing, function overloading, exceptions, and inheritance. But it does offer alternative, more desirable ways of achieving the same result. So while it may not be as familiar, it also is easier to use and faster, but it doesn't necessarily include some of the more common things that people are used to. Java. We've talked about Java a little bit in the past. Java is an object-oriented programming language. It's a compiled language, and it allows its applications to run on any operation system once the interpreter is installed. There are two benefits to it. It is object-oriented, so it can create applications, and it's platform independent. So if you compile a Java application to a specific Java interpreter, it can be installed on any system. Java is cross-platform, meaning you don't need anything extra for it to work. Um, so it can work on any system. Just because it doesn't work, just because it works on one system doesn't mean it will work everywhere. It is designed to be work that it will work on any system, but that doesn't always mean it will work perfectly or will it work at all. Uncompiled text files that have Java code will have the .java file name while well, compiled in Java application it becomes a .jar file. And it's platform agnostic, meaning you can use it wherever you need to. Java server pages, JSP and Java servlets. It's important you know that Java has these two things. Java can be used to make Java server pages, JSP, the commands are embedded into the code for HTML, and it can be used to call servlets. It's an application that must be directly installed on a remote server. So code from a Java servlet is not downloaded to the browser. So they compile the servlet and they place the servlet on a server capable of handling it. Apache Tomcat is a popular JSP. Visual Basic. This is a compiled programming language made by Microsoft. It's a standalone application and server-side web application. It's not often used as a client-side application in web browsers. Earlier versions were more procedural in nature than object-oriented, and it's now very object-oriented. It's easier to learn than C++ and Java, but does not always perform the same tasks. C Sharp. Notice I said it is C sharp. It is compiled and it's an object oriented programming language. It's designed to be easier to use but still powerful and it's a Microsoft specific language. So features so it's easier to develop for Windows. C sharp was built with Windows in mind in developing for Windows. Server side includes SSI. These are instructions within an HTML page that direct the server to do an action. It's an alternative to CGI as it does not use programming languages, but instead it's written in SGML. We talked about SGML way towards the beginning of the year. If you need to remember that, I suggest you go back and check that out. It is used to dynamically add content before the page is downloaded. So it is in the, it is on the server side and it's used to add content so it puts it in right before the page is downloaded. And it can be used to place results of a database query onto a page. So when you look, so this is kind of how searching works. When you 
search in a database, it will start pulling that information before the page even downloads. It executes other programs and it indicates the last time the displayed document was modified, uh, inserts text at the bottom of the page in the footer, and adds a current date as a timestamp. Those are all just examples of what things that server side includes can do. It's basically taking something before the web page loads and putting it in right as it right before it downloads, so it's included on the download. So SSS, SSI file name extensions, it's a server that supports SSI reads each HTML for SSI instructions, it processes the instructions for user requests and standard practices. Standard files that have SSI are .shtml or .shtm file extension names rather than your usual .html, .htmm. HTM. What this is saying is if you can tell, you can tell if there's a server site include by looking at the end of the web page. If it ends in .shtml or .shtm, that means that it is an SSI. So that's a good way to know if you have an SSI, something that is put into the page before it even downloads. So cool little trick to look out for when you're browsing on the internet. SSI support and web servers. Most web servers include SSI capability, and, but it may be disabled. Your, your server may not be configured to support SSI, but it may not be able to, to actually look for other file name extensions. So the way that you would do that is you could find the support extension type for SSI and define a MIME for the .shtml .shtm extension. This is basically making a program for it so that it would read it. But again, this is all just very basic. It's more so I'm looking for you to understand what I'm talking about rather than actually going and doing it. So in review, programming languages have multiple vocabulary terms that you should be familiar with, and there are very many server-side programming languages. Now, this was all just a very basic tutorial on these. It is not meant to educate you, nor will we go into any more de in depth about these. We're just basically, you need to know what each one does and which one each one is capable of doing. So your assignments for this, you're going to go ahead and complete the exercise that I've posted. And you'll also need to complete the checkpoint. The checkpoint is 18 questions. Um, about some of the stuff that was covered in here. And as a little hint, those 18 questions may be quiz questions. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll be available during my office hours or you can email me anytime.